It's lovely to be back at Restoration. Lovely to see everyone. And uh, wonderful that uh, this initiative, Solidarity Meeting, really is important. You know, we wage not in flesh and blood, but it's spiritual uh, forces that are at work. And it's good to be on the right side. And you know, uh, the, wo- the world is making a big thing of this word Zionism. It really is a simple thing. It's just homelandism, that the Jews can have a homeland. And it's not complicated. And certainly, if it extends beyond the borders that God has given them, we would have something to say. But I can assure you, (laughs) it is well within what the scriptures say. And it's not that uh, there is only one special nation. This is the God who loves all nations. But there is, there will be a special attack on the seed of Jacob, because, well, we know that this one we worship is called the God of Israel. Amen. Yeah, Father, I just I thank you that I can be here today. I pray that uh, as I bring word, as I bring a teaching, that I be Father in everything, that your Son would be elevated, that your Son would be glorified that we would know the one who's coming on the clouds of fire and who has eyes as burning coals. The one who left the temple and said, you will not see me until you're ready to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Jehovah. And so I just, I pray that as I talk on, uh, on this topic, that our Father, there'd be good Bereans in this place, but also if there is more for us to see of who Messiah is in the story of Israel, that we glorify and magnify him and exalt him. Amen. I want to talk about God in Israel's midst. And I want to start with a, a scripture from a little book just before uh, the book of Revelation, uh, the book of Jude. It's only one chapter, so in particular verse 5, and this is how it's written in the King James Version. It says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that our Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed them that believed not. Now what's interesting with this scripture is that if, uh, if you have the ESV, it reads a little different. It is, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, so it doesn't have that generic Lord, uh, Kyrios, that's usually used in the Greek. It's, it's actually, uh, some will say, there's this discrepancy here. Who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Now there's this famous uh, I'd say the most, the greatest uh, Greek scholar of manuscripts over the last century, his name's Bruce Metzger. And he sides with this reading. He says, and, and I mean, he's not trying to be a theologian here, he's just pure scientist, raw data, Greek manuscripts. Uh, he complains with those who, who use the, the general Lord reading because he's coming from that side. However, theologically, It just reads awkwardly, doesn't it? In fact, there's this wonderful quote that kind of describes this issue that I feel where I'm like, I can understand how they went with the generic Lord uh, instead of Messiah who saved the people out of the land of Egypt. Uh, In Bruce Metzger's descent, he states that Jesus is the best attested reading among Greek and versional witnesses that critical principles seem to require the adoption of Jesus, Jesus, Yeshua. In other words, a theologically unbiased decision based purely on the principles of textual criticism would prefer Jesus here, not the generic Lord. But this is where it comes into the theology side. Like, I'm not a, a Greek manuscripts guy, but uh, we, ter- we teach from a certain way, and, and it's quite interesting how, uh, how this goes. It says, the reason for it not being chosen was that a majority of the committee, this is the committees who sit on this awkward reading, they, th- 
they felt the reading was difficult to the point of impossibility. They were convinced, it seems, of the extreme unlikelihood that Jude would have written that Jesus was alive and active. I think we can all, we all believe he was alive. It's more the active within an Old Testament narrative. Yeah, I don't know about you. Generally, where I see Yeshua being active, uh, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Why? Because it says there was one like the Son of God. So it's like there's a little bit of a connection. But that's about it. <clears throat> uh, I, want to, I want to give the story of God and try and bring Messiah out in the Tanakh. I hope you'll let me do that. I believe in this reading, this awkward reading. But I don't think it needs to be awkward. If we understand that Paul saw someone in blazing light, and then he went to Sinai and he had to think about what is going on here. And he asked this one, what is your name, Adon? <clears throat> and he said, I am Yeshua whom you persecute. And then he went for three years. I know what it's like. Some of these things, I'll be honest, this is 18 years. As you see, I'm getting into, what does Jude talk about? Is this something? Is this? Uh, and, he, and, he, and he describes Messiah as... He comes with the statement as he sees, you know, in ancient Israel there was this duality that they understood in ancient Israel's God. <clears throat> we keep on thinking it's too much the New Testament. No, no, in ancient Israel, where he describes Messiah, Colossians 1.15, you may note, he says, He is the image, He is the image of the invisible Elohim. Big statement. Okay, so I want to bring out the image, if I may do that. Okay, and that's also what we need to understand. Um, and and so I'm going to try and help do that, so that perhaps so I could convince a few people that this doesn't read too awkwardly. So I want to go to what helps break this open a bit, because as I said, I'm just there with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's about as much as I can see of Messiah saving and being active. So Mal Malachi, does anyone know what Mal Malachi means? The name given to a prophet. <clears throat> See, some of these are in our face. Malachi means my messenger. Okay. Now you may not know this. Prophets were sometimes called messengers. Okay. In fact, the book of Malachi, he describes priests as messengers. All right. Here is a really important passage because, well, we have something that can root us into uh, 430 BC. He's writing a prophecy to Israel. The temple is built, and it's a really interesting passage here about the temple and that situation where they were at. Because we know who the first messenger is. Messiah told us this. The one who prepares the way? His cousin, right? <clears throat> Okay. He, he quotes this. He says, Behold, I will send my messenger, John the Baptist. Okay. And he will prepare the way before my face. This is really interesting. <clears throat> because some of your translations you'll have, he'll prepare the way before me. It's a little bit more, he's going to prepare the way before my face. The one who, when you come in contact, you've come face to face with the God of Israel. The invisible God you are looking upon, his face as it were and the lord whom you seek this is 430 years earlier it doesn't quite make sense does it the lord who you seek was israel seeking for this one how <clears throat> shall suddenly come to his temple his temple and here we get the description even the messenger of the covenant now the reason why uh, if, and, just, and just so you understand, everywhere else, malach is used in all of Scripture. How is it translated? Does anyone know? Everywhere else it is translated as angel. <clears throat> Here, suddenly, out of the blue, the translators don't do that. Why don't they do that? Because we kind of know what well, this is about Yeshua. Okay. But this is an important part, and this can maybe help us a bit. Okay. Here we see he is called the Malach of the Covenant. Really interesting. 
that this one who comes, that John the Baptist was preparing the way for this one who's described as the Malach of the covenant. Okay, so let's go to, and, and, and the description there of the face of the God of Israel, uh, he will prepare the way before my face. As I said, you know, I am an image of God. You are made in, in his image. But there's only one who, could, who we could describe as, because Messiah always knocks it out the park. He is the image of the invisible God, right? We also know in the book of Job that certain malachim, heavenly messengers, could be described as sons of God, okay? But there was always one who was the son of God. Only one can say that, right? And I believe as well, if Yeshua is going to knock this out the park, okay, you can have lots of malachim, you can have priests, prophets, many people bringing from the Father, coming from the Father, but there's one who will be the <clears throat> messenger who is above all. And I hopefully, if I do my job, <clears throat> as we go through the Tanakh, which is a real privilege to do, I'm going to try and go from when we came out of Egypt. And it was just so beautiful, the, the Echat oneness, I was just seeing in how, on the songs that were written, the Lamb, the God of Israel, we see this oneness of, of Israel's God. Hopefully, that passage in Malachi will make a bit more sense. But here we do see a description in ancient Israel. There was one who they, they kind of looked upon as being Elohim in their midst. In that day, yod vave shall yod vave defend, uh, defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as Elohim, as the messenger of Yehovah before them. So we're going to see this of, he is the image of the invisible God. And in ancient Israel, they knew this one in this way. <clears throat> and so last week's Torah portion, I think we kind of miss things sometimes because, well, our God is, <laughs> he, he is, you know, when, when Messiah came, he spoke in parables. And the, the scriptures is just filled with Hebrew idiom. And it's like you get a little bit here and you get a little bit here and it's hard to always piece it together, right? But I want to piece something about this moment because this moment was to be enshrined, I believe, in Israel through, <clears throat> through this in the temple. Okay, why? Why the menorah? Well, what was the menorah meant to look like? It was meant to look like a tree with branches coming off the sides, right? Okay? And then you put a fire on this tree. Okay? This is how the lamp was made. It's, a, it's an interesting thing. A tree on fire. <clears throat> okay? Now, again, we miss things because we don't have a Hebraic heritage. But hopefully now when I read something from the book of Revelation... <clears throat> We won't see how most, most of the artists depict this as they have Yeshua here and they have seven lampstands going around him. And I understand why they do that because of the way it's written, but let's read it in the light of this, the menorah, a tree that burns. <clears throat> uh, I went to, oh, did I not put it in? Good grief. Well, let's, let me describe it. You know what it is. Revelation chapter one, what does it say? He says, and I saw one standing in the midst of seven lampstands. <clears throat> and what does he describe him as? This fire burning, blazing in glory. <clears throat> All right. Okay. This is to, I really believe, to try and help us. Because uh, if we read a bit more carefully, this one who's appearing in the bush is coming as the representative of our Elohim <clears throat> and the messenger of Yehovah appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush and he looked and behold the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed it's not about the bush burning it's the one in there in glory standing there and when Yudhavave saw, when Yehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Now this is where it gets tough because 
This is one who is described as of the Father, a malach of God, and yet Moses would speak of him as speaking as Yehovah, or that he were given the titles of the Father. The titles would be applied to him. So I'm obviously coughing a lot, so I actually do have some water. But I hope you're following. And so this one was there. Okay? And our Father sent him to redeem, save my people. All right. Now, sometimes we struggle with this issue of the, the, the titles of our Father being given to this one. Okay? We know the Jews struggled with the titles of our Father being given to this one. When did Yeshua get in trouble? Where he said, before, I'll tell you, before Abraham was, I am, Haya. Okay? They picked up stones. Rather, they should have thought, who the heck can talk with this authority? <clears throat> All right? He's forgiving sins. We'll see in Exodus 23, this one can forgive sins, your trespasses. They, who is this? Who can do this? But here's Hosea many years later, and this is why I'm saying Israel had an understanding of the Son, and that the, the titles of the Father could be in Him, okay, or used in Him. And why they used the titles of the Father with this one so much is because they kept trying to get His name and He wouldn't give it. Do you remember that? Jacob. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to read about that right now. This is actually about Jacob right here. Yes, he had power, Jacob, over the Malach. Okay, and he prevailed and he wept and he made supplication unto him. Now here's an interesting one. He says, and he found him. Hosea is trying to encourage Israel. He found him in Bethel. That's not Peniel. Peniel is where he wrestled. Bethel, there's two occasions where Jacob was in Bethel. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Even, here it is, even yod heh God of hosts, Yehovah, is his memorial. It's just encouraging, it's okay. <laughs> it is this one's memorial. Now, just to pick up on Bethel, because again, you've just been through Genesis, and we need to let the image come out, the image of the invisible God come out a bit. You, you all missed this one, didn't you? Hey, when he's coming out of Laban's house, there was someone in Laban's house watching over him. Jacob begins his life as a man with a rock for a pillow. All right. But if you have this one <clears throat> watching over you, we know he came out of Laban's house and he was flabbergasted at what had happened. But here we see... A dream, it's, and this is how he relayed to his wives. He said, the messenger of Elohim spoke unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, lift up now your eyes and see, and all the rams that leap upon the cattle and the ring stakes speckled, grizzled, for I have seen all that Laban does unto you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you vowed a vow unto me. Now arise, get you out of this land and return to the land of your kindred. See, there was always... As Solomon would describe, don't get me wrong, there is Father God. <clears throat> Where Solomon built a temple, what does he say? I could never build a house for God. He says even the heaven of heavens could never contain him. But it could contain his image. And it was meant to enshrine someone. <clears throat> All right. And so we see, there was a kind of Elohim in their midst, right? And the forefathers knew this. They knew this one. They would have also had the mystery. They're like trying to figure this out. Do you remember what happened when, when he finished wrestling? What did Jacob go? You know, but I've seen God, but I should be dead. But how does this work? Okay. Not, not much has changed. Hey, when he comes and he returns, it says he will have a, a name on his side that still no one really understands. He is this great mystery of how the I am might tabernacle amongst us. <clears throat> and here's another thing that we've missed, I believe, is because we haven't understood, no, that the burning was because of he was appearing in glory and you couldn't make out the form. Now, what would we call a person in glory standing? <clears throat> I would, I'd like to suggest to you, we might, it might, he, he might have looked as a pillar of fire, okay? Now, we've also missed this. This is where I'm saying it gets exciting because what do we read about with Pharaoh? I send one to lead you out. 
the messenger of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. The pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Okay. Suddenly, you know, I'm going to give the Jude verse 5. Okay, let's think about this. Let's think maybe there's something here. And so I really believe Messiah brought Israel out to meet with Father God at the mountain. And, there was, and we see the duality, don't we? Why? Ten words, ten commandments at the mountain, and we're like, we're done. We, we've had it. Moses, you go. We've heard enough, right? But the relationship Moses had with the one, the glory cloud, he's, it says he spoke to him as a man speaks with a friend. Remember that in the book of Numbers? <clears throat> and this is the whole thing about glory. Don't we know this? Okay? And, and just so you know, the best way of understanding the mystery of the Father and the Son is to really understand men and women. <clears throat> okay. Because we are echat. All came from one man, right? He created them, male and female. And typically we are thinking of the male. It's a masculine text. That's how it's meant to be. But we are also well aware of Hidden, beautifully, <laughs> gloriously, eh? the glory comes forth, right? But also, it is, the potency is not as strong. P praise be to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. And that is a woman's glory. Okay. Grow your, I always say, that. grow your hair long. Uh, you know, just be what you were made, you know. Be that to, to us guys, you know, we look so ugly, our hair's, our hair's going and all of that. You stay the beautiful, glorious side, and then you have this potency, that strong side. Same with how we understand this one comes from the Father. <clears throat> and sometimes he's in glory. Sometimes he can be invisible. I mean, it's confusing. I'm, I'm going through this trying to figure out, okay, were they seeing this cloud all the time? Not always. Sometimes he came as a man, it would seem. But here we see, anyway, here's the, they get to Mount Sinai. And here's a, here's, a, here's a scripture that really encouraged me to keep going down this path of Messiah who saved Israel out of Egypt, to see him as the redeeming hand. Isaiah chapter 63, 9 and 10, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. The prophet, they knew this one. Who's he talking about? And the messenger of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bore them and he carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and they vexed his set-apart spirit. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy and he fought against them. They knew this one. This one tabernacled in their midst. And what's interesting here is you go a few chapters earlier. If you, you, this is a way to prove the echat oneness of God because... Early on, he said, uh, Yehovah alone is your Redeemer and your Savior. So then why is this one also being described as their Redeemer and the Savior? He's one with the Father. <clears throat> Are you seeing it? Amen. And he bore them. They knew him as one who carried them all the days of old. A mystery. You see, other gods, okay? And we sometimes get this wrong. <clears throat> Our Father's house, Okay? was not for the Father. In the ancient worlds, when you built a temple, okay, they did not believe that the God resided there. They would make an image of that God to live in their temples. Okay? And they believed, so if you went to Zeus and the statue of Zeus, and it, they, they, they knew, no, Zeus lives on Mount Olympus. Okay, which actually shows, you know, you're not dealing with the God of gods. You can't house him anywhere. Okay, but anyway, it was an image of, right? Our father would create a tabernacle and the temple to enshrine what his image and what was most dear and set apart for him, his son. That is his glory, that it was for him. Okay, this is how, because I don't know if you've wrestled with these. Solomon builds a temple, and then the next thing he says, actually, the God of gods can't even dwell in temples or even the heaven of heavens. And then you're like, well, what's the point? What are we doing here? But we keep moving. Let's keep moving forward. 
He redeemed them. There was one in their midst. He was there. And, uh, you know, this is what, what I'm getting at. Not just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was there. What do I have here? Oh, with the Redeemer thing. Okay. They knew this, this Redeemer. This is Jacob. Genesis 48. The blessing. He prayed to this one to bless Joseph's children. Do you know that? He says, the messenger which redeemed me from all evil, bless these lads. All right. Interesting, huh? They knew this, this, this was one God, and the, he is the image of the invisible God. For I know, he has, oh, this is beautiful, Job. Because we kind of think this idea of the end days and the resurrection, that we get a little glimpse with Daniel. And the, listen to this of Job. Job says, I know my Redeemer lives. And he will stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. <clears throat> it was, he was known. They still hadn't complete. I'm not saying they'd figured him out. Anyone know Proverbs 30? He's still, they're still trying to figure out in the book of Proverbs. It says, who's, who, who's ascended and descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? What is his name? What is his son's name? Remember that proverb? They, so they knew him, but the mystery of Israel's God, that who was in their midst. So they got to the mountain, and this is important, because when they got to the mountain, now we have our Father. He can help us understand some of these things, and well, one of them is really important. On the mountain, this is what he says, our Father in heaven says to Moses, Behold, I send a messenger before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. Zechariah chapter 3, you can go there in your own time. We see this pardoning of transgressions like he, he it's like Israel's you're involved with this one and and the, the, he's going to get jealous he's going to fight against you he's going to listen to him obey him but here's what's important sorry after that for my name the name of the father that I am no greater name is in him and we saw back in Isaiah the messenger of the presence I think we should really yeah you know, he's literally of that divine nature, like no, no, other, no other one. All right. And then we see also, we're going to see he's a great fighter as well. So Israel went from Mount Sinai, and this one would lead, okay? Led them to the land, the Shekhinah presence of God, sometimes visible, sometimes not there, image of God in their midst led them. And you keep reading in the days of Joshua and going into uh, yeah, through Joshua in the beginning of the book of Judges, you keep reading about Gilgal. Why Gilgal? Because this one they would inquire of, because you wanted him in battles. He kept coming back to Gilgal, okay? He was the one who would clear out the land for them. This is what God said in Exodus chapter 23. My messenger, he'll go before you, and he's going to bring you into the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, all of those. Again, later, he says it as well. I send a messenger before you. I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite. This one is the great warrior. We think Israel's just suddenly became this amazing army. They're just the most skilled fighters ever. They had a bit of help. Okay? The host of heaven's armies were assisting. Okay. And so now... Knowing Gilgal is where the first place the tabernacle stayed, I hope this next passage may make a bit more sense to us. It says in Judges chapter 2 and verse 1, it says, And a messenger of Jehovah came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go up out of Egypt and have brought you into land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. Let's remember Malachi chapter 3. He's the messenger of the covenant. This one's making covenant, okay? 
And there they actually, and they make sacrifices there, which is also something. We get to the days of Samuel. I love the days of Samuel. And named my first son Samuel. Um, but he also has, it's very interesting with his encounter. I think he had more the encounter that was a bit like Moses when he spoke in a friendly way. Samuel. Samuel. The description was, yod Vave stood there and spoke. <clears throat> Now, we can, we can metaphor this out as much as you want, or we can begin to, say, begin to see that there was somewhere there. This was the Mashiach. This is the anointed one, king of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. It wasn't just saying that. There was one there, and he fought for them. And what we see in the days of Samuel is they weren't paying their dues, and as Father warned on the mountain, if you don't, if you don't obey him, he's not going to help you guys. We just saw that in Judges, but when it carries on in Judges, he says, you didn't listen to me, I'm not going to help you anymore. And Israel was getting whacked. They were just, the Philistines were everywhere, they were coming around, they were around Shiloh. And so does Israel repent and come and, and, do, and let's, let's honor him and let's come to Shiloh and honor this one? No, they, 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 they turn the Ark of the Covenant into a gimmick. We need to get our God into battle. Go get the, go, go get the Ark from the priest. <clears throat> and he agrees, I believe, the messenger of the presence agrees to, I'll go along with this. Let's see where this goes. Do you know the story? I love the story. Okay. This is what I call when the Ark of the Covenant became the hot potato. I got that from a friend of mine. Because they go into battle and the, and the Philistines capture it. And they're so happy and they go take it and they put the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of their God. Then what happens the next morning? Yeah, they wake, they wake up the next morning and Dagon's fallen over. Must be some kids, you know. Let's put some guards, let's just watch this. Well, the next morning, Dagon hasn't just fallen over, his head's off, his, his arms are off, and they're perfectly lying on the threshold of the temple. And they realize there's a little bit more to this God of Israel and how they say he is amongst them. And so they're, they're like, okay, well, let's send this treasure chest. We're going to send it to some other Philistine uh, city. And what happens? This is also important to understand. Plague, a plague breaks out. Okay? This is important. Okay? Why? Because we don't give enough honor to the one who redeemed in Egypt. You know, all those plagues, all those tests, all those trials, there's one who will destroy when he fights for his people. Okay? So all these plagues are going out, they're hopping, they're giving, you have it, you have it, eventually they don't want this anymore. What do they do? They put it on a cart, and they get a calf who hasn't been weaned yet. They say, well, if this is the God of gods, let's see what happens. And this calf walks perfectly to an Israelite city, and there they put the ark. And during this time, the ark uh, uh, was just in that city, no one was really doing much about it. It's just, it's, it's so random, some of these passages, just living in that city for a bit. And we get through to the time of Sam, uh, through the time of Saul. And then we get to the time of King David. This is where it's going to get interesting, because it almost seems as though he's vanished in this period. Not really getting much. Where's God in our midst? <clears throat> and when we get to David, what's interesting about David is, you know, when he beats Goliath, you know, you get that sense that maybe there's someone with him. <clears throat> maybe there's someone fighting for David here, raising him up in the background. Okay. I was joking about this yesterday, but you certainly get this idea when Paul, when, when Saul says to David, if you want my daughter, uh, Michal, go get me 200 foreskins of, of the Philistines. And that afternoon he brings them in. <clears throat> And he gets a wife. It's like, this is not normal stuff going on here. And his rise to glory is, it's phenomenal, right? And he eventually gets the city of cities. He's in Jerusalem, wives. The Phoenicians are bringing cedars. And they're building him a palace fit for a king. Everything's sorted out. 
And there's one relic he wants. He's like, go get me that ark. I want the ark in here. We'll make a nice tent. This wasn't the tabernacle. He made his own tent. Go get the ark. And he knew that it was carried by an ox and there was something about a wagon or whatever. Uh, put it on a wagon and bring it to Jerusalem. And then the priest can be around it and what have you. Well, it's here that I really believe that the priest should have emphasized this is the throne of our God. See those pictures of how they used to carry Pharaoh and other kings, great ones? They didn't just go and put that on the back of the bucky. All right? There should have been some dignity. And a priest who should have, they should have said, no, 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 we have to carry this. And it begins to topple at one point, and we know the story. One of them reaches out, he wants to steady it, and he's killed. Now, rather than a humble David coming, what do we read? David was angry with God. And what he could have done is said, guys, we carry it from here. He didn't do that, okay? A little bit of a hissy fit. I must be careful what I say. One day I'm going to actually be uh, hopefully with these people, so I must be careful. But he's not, you know, he says, go take it into that house there. Obed Edom. Just put it there. <clears throat> Let's leave it. Well, three months later, what happens? News gets to David that, uh, well, while the ark has been at Obed-Edom's house, he's turned into a mix of Elon Musk, Rockefeller, and the Rothschilds dynasty. This guy is prospering like you cannot believe. Then, and this gets to David, and suddenly David rethinks this. All of a sudden, three months later, he's like, okay, let's send the priests, and let's bring the ark here. So they go to Obed-Edom's house, and they bring the ark to they bring the ark to Jerusalem. <clears throat> now, when you read in the, in, the, in the mix here, is that eventually then we do see the one who is the messenger of the covenant, the one who is the messenger of his presence. He has an interesting encounter with David. There's one more place, and he does come back and suddenly he's lifted out of, this, out of the text again. they God in their midst. And what happens here, it seems as though David glories in himself. He looks at what he's built, he looks at everything, and he gets that point where there's iniquity in his heart. And although he had done some censuses that were fine, he does one where they know the spirit of this was, this is King David counting his servants. He's, he's counting his subjects. How many do I have? I want to go. He sends Joab, his... Uh, captain of his army. And Joab's disgusted in this. I think he only did like three tribes, and he's like, that's enough of the census. Uh, they felt insulted. The prophet Nathan comes to David, and he sets him up beautifully that David did not understand where this has come from, <clears throat> and that you weren't giving glory to whom we should glorify. So listen, this is quite sneaky. How the, how the curse, do you remember how the curse, you can choose. He gives a choice. The first choice, David, you can have three years of famine. Okay, <laughs> three years of famine. Second one, you can have three months of your enemies, they will beat you in battle. Okay, and the last one he says to them, David, or you can have three days of the plague. And David chooses the plague. He did not understand the one who just in the midnight hours could destroy the firstborns of Egypt. He didn't understand the one who in the days of Hezekiah, it says he left the temple when Assyria was surrounded and he killed him in the host of heaven, killed 170,000, 75,000 Assyrians. You can look today at the map of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. They, they conquered everything, Egypt, the whole of Mesopotamia, everywhere. You'll see one little spot. Even the secular historians have to do this. There's one little spot in the Neo-Assyrian Empire never conquered, Judah. Of course, he was a bit scared. The Assyrian, the Assyrian uh, leader 
was learning to respect him, but like the Philistines. But also David here was going to have to learn just who this is. Who's the one, the lifter of our heads? Who's the one that decimates people? Who is the one who controls our destiny and chooses which vessels he chooses to raise up and how he, how he manifests through history? So, he, he asked for the plague. Do I have what's written there? Nah. He asked for the plague, and basically the plague begins. The, he, and he originally said, I want you to do a census from Dan to Beersheba. Well, now he gets the plague from Dan to Beersheba, and then in the morning, okay, the hosts of heaven are going a little light here, but still, 70,000 people have died. And it says that when they looked at over Jerusalem, it says there was an angel standing with a sword and his finger pointing at a piece of ground. And Nathan the prophet, I think it was Nathan, he, you know, he's going, David, you need to purchase that land, you need to build that altar, and you need to sacrifice there and appease this one. Get going. <clears throat> Aruna the Jebusite who owned the threshing floor, he says, I'll give it to you. David realized, no, 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 he's out for blood here. This has to be a sacrifice. I'm buying this from you. I'm buying this. He does do the offering, and fire comes from heaven. This is also, just so you know, he's connected to the fire from heaven. He's here with Gideon and with Samson's parents. Fire from heaven. God answers by fire. Now, we may think, okay, the relationship is resolved here. Here's where it gets interesting. Here's where it gets very interesting. And we've got to read the text and allow it to come out because what happens, it seems, is that God who was in their midst decides, you know what, I need to teach the house of David a lesson. I need to teach them a lesson. There's a greater king in their midst. And he leaves Jerusalem and he goes to a, a Gibeon where, we can read here, uh, where the tabernacle at that time still stood. So people were offering in Gibeon, and then this new altar in Jerusalem was beginning to develop. But he leaves and he goes to Gibeon. How do we know this? This is a fascinating passage. <clears throat> For the tabernacle of Jehovah, which Moses made in the wilderness, and the altar of the burnt offering were at that season in the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go before it to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the message of Jehovah. Fascinating. This man who said, I love to be in your courts, I love to be in your prayer. Israel's going there. So the, king's, the house of David at this point is a bit excluded on the outside. The relationship's been frayed. It's this awkward season that develops. Anyway, what we know is that who was to build the temple? Solomon. Solomon builds the temple and he knows, he says, the God of God, you know, uh, God cannot be contained in a house. You're not housing God. But there was the mystery of the image of that God, or the Son of God, or however we understand this. And. Here's, here's another passage that I find interesting. Do you know where he, where he built it? Okay. Funny enough, it was where Abraham was also in contact with this one, in a place called Moriah. Read it again. You'll see he was there. The description was, Solomon began to build the house of Jehovah at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah, where Jehovah appeared unto David his father. Why? This is the image. This one was the image of the invisible God. We're beginning to see it. In the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. That's where he built the... That's where he built it. <clears throat> so we're beginning... Anyway, we're beginning to see... You now there was... There was someone there. I keep telling people, I want to go to Gibeon. I want to go to these places in Israel today. Because he was there. It's like, you know, I'm not dreaming this up. In fact, let me not leave this out. Solomon builds a temple. He knows if we have a temple without the one that the Father wishes to enshrine here, it's not quite 
we, you know, we're missing the purpose here a bit. Humility. I mean, Solomon moved for nobody. This is the king. People come see the king. The kings don't. But what does he do? You can read about it. He goes to Gibeon. I don't know if you've read this. Now it's all making sense. He goes to Gibeon and it says he offered up thousands of sacrifices there, repenting for the house of David. We gloried in ourselves. We thought this was through our hand or whatever. Who are we? We, we know we really irritated you. We need to restore the breach. <clears throat> Please come. And at the inauguration we see fire from heaven fell. That pillar and God took residence in the temple. Okay. So the mystery of, of this one, the angel of the presence, I really believe. But let's tie it. Let's try and get it to where it makes sense. Well, this will already, I think, make a little bit of sense to you why in Malachi's day, 400 years before Messiah comes, they would talk about the message of the face coming to his temple. Okay? But you, we're going to find in Ezekiel, when you read Ezekiel, God who would stand on the threshold as, as, a, as a fire and, and, and as a pillar, he calls Ezekiel and he says, listen, this is right towards the end where he's had enough. And he takes, the, he takes him through the temple courtyard. He says, you think I don't see what they're doing there? I see this image. Do you think I don't see that image? They set up there. These people have dug down into there and they've got these unholy whatever. Their backs are turned against me. They're worshiping the sun. I've had enough. The description of the glory departing, what was it? He goes through the east gate, goes up, and it says he went to the Mount of Olives in Ezekiel's day, the eastern mount, and departed. Okay. Some things are hopefully, I think, making sense. By the way, uh, I won't go there. So, <clears throat> he departed. The glory left. The house of Judah goes into Babylon. They come back. They do build the temple. But now Malachi, I think this makes more sense. Okay? I send a messenger. It's going to be a, a prophet, a Malachi, someone like Malachi. He's going to prepare the way before my face. And the Lord whom you seek, they had not forgotten. They knew the story. Their parents passed out them. We had a living image. This one was how we looked upon our God. The Lord whom you seek, he shall suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you delight in. They delighted in him. And then we see... But it's not how they anticipate it, right? What does it say? But he will refine the sons of Levi. He's a, he's a refining fire. We see he goes in there, right? Tearing it down, restoring in a different way. <clears throat> and so I really believe, just so you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, let me finish and I'll come to you, I'll come to you uh, after we're done. Anyway, and, and so we see that <clears throat> the, Messiah, the Messiah came, not how they understood, but they did know someone, and in their days he was called, they understood this one to be known as the Son of God. I, I, this, is my, this is my belief, okay? This one who I've been showing back there, the mystery of, I believe in ancient Israel, they... At that time of the first century, they knew him as the Son of God. And I'll tell you why. Because usually when demons were crying out, Son of God, Son of God, he would put, stop that, stop that. But he would refer to himself as the Son of Man. Okay, more and more, right? So there's twice in the Gospels where the Son of God comes out. Just twice. The one time is when they're on the seas. And the ship is everywhere. <laughs> and they've given up hope. And this is the wildest wind ever. And they know they're seconds away from death. And the disciples cry, help us. He speaks. And the waves are silenced. And the disciples say, surely this is the Son of God. And the description and follows by, and they worshipped him. 
It's interesting, this was not typical. Okay. The other place is with the blind man. He heals a blind man, and then he says to them, he doesn't say, do you believe in the Messiah? It's interesting, he says, do you believe in the Son of God? And the blind man who now sees, he says, I, I do, but who is he? <clears throat> and he says there as well, it is I who speak unto you. And also, what's it followed by? It's followed by, the, and he worshipped him. I really think ancient Israel, and it carried through an understanding of who they may worship as the image of their God. Let me find the scripture I was wanting here. Let's not forget in Exodus 33 verse 10. All the people saw the cloud, cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. This is something you could see. It was a representation of their God. And all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. I believe there was an understanding of this one. And this is who they desired to return. Maybe we can understand a little bit more why Messiah said things like, if you if you're just known, even you, at least in this day, the things which belong unto your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes, because you did not know the time of your visitation. You didn't understand this visiting that's happened here, Israel. His final words on the mount, what were they? I tell you the truth, Israel, you will not see me again until you are ready to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey. That's what's written in the Psalms. Okay? And we typically have known him. Let's be honest. We read of him. We know him more like Jacob as that man kind of figure. But in that day, when he returns... What's the description? He is coming on the clouds of heaven with fire. And every knee will bow. And Paul is not out of place. The anti-missionaries say Paul was out of place for doing this. Because Paul took a scripture in Isaiah about Jehovah, the God of Israel. And he said, Paul took it and he said, Because every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Yeshua is master. He gave him the name that is above every other name. <clears throat> so I don't know what, uh, have I finished here? So, so Jude chapter 5, uh, Jude verse 5. I'm really seeing another side of the one who was the image of the invisible God. He was the savior and redeemer of old. It even makes what he did and giving his life even more painful. And there's certain cultural traditions, and, you know, if you say angel, everyone's just thinking wings. But now to realize priests were technically angels and prophets, you suddenly realize where some of this deception comes in. If we can realize he is the messenger of the covenant, okay? He made a covenant, and we're coming to this tomorrow, you say, what's with Israel? <clears throat> well, to Abraham, he said, Abraham, go and cut some, <clears throat> uh, cut some sacrifices, put it in two. Then he puts a a Abram to sleep because Abram, Isaac, and Jacob were only to know him as El Shaddai, not in glory, okay? Puts him to sleep. But what's the description? It says, and a burning torch and a smoking oven went between the pieces. This one cut the covenant. Even Rashi says, this was the divine Shekhinah establishing the covenant. So this is, on the one side, uh, I don't want it to be theology. <clears throat> what I want it to be is that we understand our Father raised Messiah from the dead. He's glorified Him. And more than that, he has seated him on the throne. <clears throat> and we need to do the same. We need to glorify him. I don't know if there's some Davids here who need that warning of rebuke. Okay? Where you think in your own strength you've built your business. Where in your own strength you think you've established your families. 
where you think in your own strength, you have done this and you have done that and, he, and you are great in your own eyes and you do not realize there is more than what you may understand. There's a greater reality. And never stop to glorify him. Give thanks to the one who establishes us, who blesses us. That is what Jacob did. He blessed over Joseph's boy. Always give thanks. Don't get arrogant. Don't get uh, to pali pali. Yes, he loves us. He's our savior. He's redeemer. Yes, he did call the children. Say, let the children come unto me. There's that side. Don't, there is Levi Jesus. There is gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But then what was there? And if you harm one of these, I'm going to take a millstone and put it around your neck. We're going to throw you into the deep. <clears throat> We need to walk in the fear and the love. <clears throat> and I think this is also maybe why we battle to kind of see him on that side because it's hard to see him as the destroyer. But I really believe we're moving into days where he will come on the clouds and every knee will bow and you're going to see another side. I'm not going to read it now, but you can read the beginning of Isaiah chapter 63. I'll say it from my head. Who's this one who comes from Basra, from Edom, with garments dipped in blood? As he treads out the wine press, soaked. <clears throat> His vengeance, the vengeance of the day of the Lord, seeing all the iniquity and all the unrighteousness coming to set things straight. And you fear this one. <clears throat> His grace was there for a long time, as I explained in Ezekiel. There's that image there, there's a bit of stuff, but there comes a time where he's like, done, done. And so I believe we do have a Savior who both saves us but will also destroy us. Fear Him. You can not just destroy the flesh, but destroy body and soul. Walk in humility. Amen. Father, I just thank you that I could, I could share this that's on my heart. I do pray that we'd meditate on this and, and think about Mashiach your greatest anointed one. And that we would understand there is times where he will come in glory where you dare not even look upon his face. But I thank you as well. I thank you for the humility of Messiah as well. That he would even step out of glory. <clears throat> And be amongst us. And he would not just do that, but that he would humble himself as a servant. And that he would not only just do that, but he would take on that tree for us. <sighs> Amazing love. How can it be, Yeshua, that you, you, our King, would die for us? And so we glorify you. And Messiah, I pray, this is also, I know, much of the resting of my heart because I see people leave you. <clears throat> and, uh, and lose faith. And they don't see you as a chut with the Father. And so they lose the sight special revelation given to us. Venus Shabbat Shemayim, we know that you are far above us and your ways are not our ways, your thoughts are not our thoughts, but from your bosom you can beget one in our midst and that this isn't just new covenant faith, this is the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Help us to understand Messiah more and more, that we may glorify him and know him, and that we may yearn for that day when he will come on that eastern mountain in glory and he will pass through that eastern gate. And we will know Emmanuel, our Redeemer, lives, and in our flesh we shall see Elohim. Thank you for the hope of glory. And we pray these things in the name of Messiah Yeshua. 
who has the name above every other name. Amen. Amen. Amen.